Good morning and welcome to worship. I am Pastor Carrie and I serve the congregations of Holy Trinity and St. Andrews here in Central Iowa. Welcome, if you are a first time visitor, please hit the subscribe button and you will be made aware of when we post uh, new content. And welcome again to those uh, parishioners and longtime visitors who are joining us this morning. As hard as it is to worship in this time apart, we are glad that you are doing so with us today and in this way. So welcome to worship, to a time of praise and thanksgiving. Let us center ourselves for worship with a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and we do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ, through whom we have attained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us give, let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in singing our gathering hymn, Come to Me, All Pilgrims Thirsty. In the Cranberry Hymnal, it's number 477. <laughs>
Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now turn to God's Word. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look! a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Recently, I keep hearing this phrase spun around uh, on social media and in conversations with friends, and it's this. Don't be a Karen. Now, it took some digging for me to learn what don't be a Karen means, because I wasn't brave enough to ask. And it turns out the phrase don't be a Karen is a line that people use when you're trying to point out to someone else their entitled behavior. Kind of like when someone, when I was growing up, would call someone a denim Debbie for wearing jeans and denim head to toe or calling someone a negative Nancy for being on the more pessimistic side of life. It can be very confusing to hear a cultural reference if you're not familiar with it, or if you happen to be a Karen or a Debbie or a Nancy, it can be very irksome to have your name thrown around to describe something that probably doesn't describe you very well. Besides encountering the phrase, don't be a Karen this week, I was surprised at how often I heard people say, good Christian, in reference to someone or a faith belief. I don't know why it stood out this week more than others, and I'm not sure why it kind of bothered me, but it did. What does being good have to do with being Christian? That was the question swirling around my brain this week as I prepared for our sermon and our worship time. Because it turns out a person can be good and not be a Christian. You can be kind, generous, moral, and responsible without believing in a divine being. And the reverse can be true. You can be a Christian and not be a good person. Any student of church history knows that the church has done some pretty terrible things in the name of Christianity, and people were a part of that. So, the question today is, what does being a Christian give you that being a good person doesn't? 
Why do we link good and Christian together as opposed to assuming that if you're Christian, you're good, or if you're good, you're a Christian? Why specify good Christian? Being a Christian gives us specific things. Namely, being a Christian gives us hope. Hope for the life that we live now and hope for the life that is to come. As theologian Debbie Thomas puts it, being a Christian assures me that I am known and I am loved by a generous, self-giving God. It means that I am not alone when I suffer. I'm accompanied by Jesus who has experienced pain and loss, betrayal and death. Being a Christian gives me a distinct set sense of purpose and vocation to do justice, to love mercy, and to practice humility before God and others. But there is something additional. There is something heavier and weightier that distinguishes good from being Christian. Christianity gives us our sinfulness. The word Christian points out not how good we are, but that we are sinners in need of redemption, in need of reconciliation. So in all the synonyms and in all the meanings and all the weight of the word Christianity, it means we are sinners. The word Christian accuses us before it absolves us. The word Christian declares us captive before it sets us free. Being good is something that we think originates within ourselves, but being Christian knows that we are sinful and goodness comes from God. So all the goodness that lives in us is not created by ourselves, but is gifted to us by a generous, abundant, good God. Sin is a deadly business, and we are powerless against it without the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So before your being a Christian feels nice and it feels good, being a Christian first points out your sin, and that hurts. Not only that, Christianity giving us our sinfulness, but Christianity also gives us a robust vocabulary, a wide possibility of ways to confess our sin, to articulate the ways in which we are captive to sin, but have been set free by Christ. And Paul says this so beautifully, just like Paul, to say everything so beautifully. But in the book of Romans, he says, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul knows that in his efforts to do good, he falls into the trap of satisfying his own wants and his own desires and perpetuates a sin that only God can absolve. I do not understand my own actions. I thought I was doing good. I thought I was doing right. And in reflection, because everything is clear in hindsight. I recognize the way in which my sin permeated the actions that I did. And I recognize that God is the one who reclaims what we do for the good of the kingdom. Paul isn't talking about his inability to stop sinning. Paul, even though we think of him as a good Christian, the perfect model of a good Christian, Paul knew that when he wanted to do good, his own efforts got in the way, and he ended up doing that which he hated, which was sin. And I don't know anyone who loves the word sin. I know a lot of people who tolerate the word sin, but when we hear sin, we think shame. 
We think guilt, punishment, fiery pits. And there are fundamental groups that actively perpetuate that image. They use that fear and that shame and that guilt into getting compliance. As opposed to your sin being the thing that calls you into repentance so you can be set free. To live liberated and joyous. And even within our own faith tradition, in our own faith heritage, we have skewed our interpretation of scripture and doctrine to make sin seem harsh. Sin has become this word that now drives us away from God as opposed to welcoming us into God's arms. And on top of that, on top of all of that weight, the world today is jaded. The world is mistrusting of faith because leaders have emphasized certain sins over others because of cultural or political or social reasons. There are people within arm's reach of you that grew up in faith traditions where they were told that their sin was too great of a hurdle for God to love them. There are people who know when sin has been used to accuse them and not set them free. There are generations of people who grew up hearing that it was a sin to dance or to play cards or to drink a beer, all the while their faith tradition debased other non-religious groups or misused creation or gained wealth at the sake of others. Sin is a state and a being. Sin is being seen as so many things, but sin is not the ending point. When we are reminded of our sin, it calls us to turn and repent, to be forgiven so we can be set free. But we dislike the word sin because it threatens our perception of the goodness that we have worked so hard to obtain. The word sin threatens our independence and our autonomy, and what better time to talk about threatened sense of freedom and liberty than on this 4th of July weekend. Even on a day when most of our country celebrates liberty and freedom, we still woke up this morning sinners. We came to worship so we could be set free from our sin because God is the one who liberates us. God is the one who sets us free from the powerful forces of sin, death, and despair. So we don't like talking about sin because it reminds us that the only thing that can free us is God, not ourselves, not our own efforts, not our own sacrifices. We would rather think that living a good and a decent life is all about willpower and determination or about God-given privileges. Rather than to follow Paul's example and confess that we are actually up against an aggressive, otherworldly, dare I say, demonic force that enslaves us even when we're convincing ourselves of our own decency and our own piety and our own worthiness. I don't think there is anything more offensive in the world than telling someone that they are absolutely powerless, that they are a sinner and that they are in need of help and salvation because we can't get past the fact that we have equated sin to rejection. We have linked the word of sin to damnation and we can't get past it to resurrection and reconciliation and new life. But sin as damnation is a cultural interpretation. The Christian reference of the word sin should lead us not to images of damnation and hellfire, 
but the word sin should be linked to the truth that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, that the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that the Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. There are few things as vulnerable as recognizing your own sin, preparing for hard words and rejection, but instead receiving the welcoming, comforting words. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And that's what grace feels like to get off the treadmill of trying to resolve your own sins, of trying to save yourselves, to simply say, yeah, that's my sin. That is my baggage. And have God say, I love you. You are forever my child. And you're forgiven. We prepare ourselves for the fight of salvation and the fight of freedom and the fight for liberty. And we forget that our sin is met with grace, with mercy, with peace and love. So when we say someone is a good Christian, it's really easy to trick ourselves into thinking that they have somehow done something to make their state of goodness or righteousness before God. We forget that that goodness is theirs because God gave it to them. Because their Christian practices helped nurture it, not despite their sin, but because they've been redeemed. It's our misunderstanding of the word Christian that trips us up. Because being a Christian is first dependent on being called that which we do not want to be. Sinners. Who though we have been forever redeemed and reconciled to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will always be sinners in need of Jesus's salvation. And Jesus, I would like to point out was also called a glutton and a drunkard in our gospel today. God, the source of all goodness, the source of all life, stands in the midst of creation and people call him things that we don't want to be called. A glutton and a drunkard, things that many Christian traditions value. To be able to abstain, to have restraint, and Jesus came to earth and he ate and he drank and he laughed and he danced and he wept with people. And God on earth was judged for it. And it's this line in scripture that makes me kind of wish that Jesus had pulled a, a pretty woman moment when he came back after the resurrection. By that I mean in the movie Pretty Woman, Julia Roberts walks into a store and she's shopping and she is snubbed by the shop owners. And she comes back into the store later after she has gotten help and looks beautifully stylish. And she looks at everyone and says, big mistake, not helping me. I want Jesus to come back and say, big mistake, judging me. It turns out I was God. But that's not what Jesus does. God never gets even. Not pre-resurrection and not post-resurrection. Christ doesn't come rub our failures and our sin in our face. Rather, Jesus comes to us and says, come to me, all you, all you sinners that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you, you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
it is such a heavy burden. The facade of being perfect. It is such a weighty struggle to keep that illusion in place. Like ducks that glide on a pond, we want to see that still composed image and we forget that under the water, their feet are paddling furiously to keep them afloat. It's exhausting. Trying to not be a sinner, it's exhausting pretending to be perfect, trying to be something that we are not. Trying to show people that they are wrong about the snap judgments and the assumptions that they make about us, about our faith traditions, about our communities. Jesus really did have it all figured out. Rather than die under the weight of trying to correct assumptions of those who judged him, Jesus did what God sent him to do. He rested and he danced and he ate really good food and he drank with people who were mourning and people who were celebrating, he lived to reveal God's presence and God's abundance, to show that God is not far away, but close at hand. To try and avoid sin, either as a word, or to try and avoid the ramifications of our sin in our everyday life, that's a mistake. To avoid the word sin cheapens the word grace. For we cannot feel the full gift, the full freeing gift of grace, if we don't feel the full weight and sting of, of being forgiven. To avoid the topic of sin only increases the weight and the burdens that we carry, and it makes them harder to put down, even for the sake of that light gentle load that Christ offers instead. So as vulnerable as Paul's words from the book of Romans makes us feel, it tells the truth. We are both beautiful and broken. We are 100% sinner and 100% saint at the same time. We are made in God's divine image but we are enslaved to something that actively wars against our efforts to be good and to do good. Good Christians are still sinners. And sinners are still good in the eyes of the Lord, for he loves them. He sent his only beloved son to die for us. So don't try and be too wise or so enlightened that you miss the simple divine presence of God that is in front of you today. Be you. Be a Christian sinner who has been redeemed and reconciled and saved through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Let that truth inspire you into Christian living into tackling your fear of sin so you can be liberated, to live, to serve your neighbors. Take up the offer that Christ gives you today. Set down those heavy and life-stealing burdens that you carry so you can pick up the grace, the light, airy, free grace the peace and the hope that Christ brings to you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Lord of All Hopefulness. In the red hymnal, that's 765, and in the green hymnal, it's 469.
Let us pray. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Free us from stagnant faith. Where Christians are assembling for worship in person, protect them from viral infection. Where Christians are worshiping with print and screen, grant them steadfastness in your word. Strengthen those believers who doubt your goodness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy and our care for creation. And direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations. Keep the world from war. Pave the way for just elections. Protect citizens from the designs of autocratic rulers. Uphold our courts. Guide our national and state government in finding ways to redress the wrongs, to seek justice and mercy, to fight for the end of racism and to ensure equality for all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. Console the fearful. Feed the hungry. House the homeless. Shelter the runaways. Heal the many who are newly afflicted with the coronavirus and guide researchers in discovering a vaccine. Visit the sick. Those that we name aloud now or silently in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for infants and young children that they be carefully tended. We pray for teens that they keep patience throughout the contagion. We pray for school boards, that they find solutions for the fall semester. We pray for the unemployed, that they find jobs. For medical workers, that they remain healthy. We pray for the aged, and especially those in our care. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, for the sake of him who bore the heavy yoke for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into, into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A few announcements before our blessing and the conclusion of our service. This coming Sunday on July 12th, the Congregation of St. Andrews will worship outdoors in person at St. Andrews Lutheran Church. If you do plan to attend that service, we invite you to bring a lawn chair. The sermon, uh, the bulletin that was mailed to you, either in the mail or electronically, 
and be uh, anticipating being spread out. There will be markers and we do invite you to wear masks. If you are feeling ill or insecure about your health, please stay home. We will continue to have online services available for you probably forever. So the uh, Congregation of Holy Trinity, um, the online services will still be made available to you. Please do not shy away from calling us in our office if you have any questions or concerns. Let us know how we can be supporting you in this time through prayer, conversation, or just a listening presence. And with that, I invite you on this 5th of July to receive a blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Our sending hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That's 742 in the red hymnal and 439 in the green.
Go in peace. Christ goes with you. Thanks be to God.